Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to what we hope and know will be an exciting seminar today. I welcome you all. We have some uh, most um, eminent people in our audience, and we have, of course, two most eminent speakers to talk to you today. This event is organised by the Centre for Commercial Law and Regulatory Studies, or CLARS, in the Faculty of Law at Monash University. Today is going to be another example, in addition to our already immensely successful two seminar series. One of them is the Commercial Court Seminar Series and the other is the National Commercial Law Seminar Series. These are examples of what we're now doing in the faculty for the commercial arms of the profession. My name is Anne Minotti. I'm the Director of CLARS and today I'm standing in as Chair of this session for the Dean, Professor Brian Horrigan. Unfortunately, um, Professor Brian Horrigan was struck down with an illness last night and is just not well enough to be here today. I'd like to acknowledge that Professor Horrigan was instrumental in designing this event, instrumental in having our eminent speakers attend to talk to you and is deeply sorry for missing it. If there was ever an event he wanted to be at, it was this one. Now, our speakers today will outline the conclusions and recommendations contained in the final report on Australian's Competition <coughs> Policy Review. We're privileged to hear from the chair of the review panel, Professor Ian Harper, and from a panel member, Mr Michael O'Brien QC. They'll also discuss the implications and necessary next steps from an economic and legal perspective. I'd like to introduce both speakers to you now. Professor Ian Harper, who is immediately on my left and who you, is probably well known to everyone here. He's a leading Australian economist who has worked closely with governments, lawyers, banks, corporates, leading professional services firms at the highest level. Professor Harper is a partner at Deloitte Access Economics and chaired the Competition Policy Review Panel. He is also an Emeritus Professor at the University of Melbourne. He served as inaugural chairman of the Australian Fair Pay Commission from December 2005 to July 2009 and was one of three panellists chosen to review Victoria's state finances in January 2011 and February 2012. Professor Harper is currently a member of the Australian Advisory Board of Bank of America, Merrill Lynch, he was elected a Fellow of the Academy of Social Sciences in Australia in 2000 and a Fellow of the Australian Institute of Company Directors in 2009. Mr Michael O'Brien, QC, is Queen's Counsel at the Victorian Bar. He has practised extensively in the areas of competition and consumer law, previously as a partner of the law firm Minter Allison from 1992 to 2002 and currently as a barrister. He was a panel member of the Competition Policy Review and is a member and past chairman of the Competition and Consumer Committee of the Law Council of Australia. Mr O'Brien also practices generally in commercial law, corporate and securities law, administrative and constitutional law. I'm going to invite Professor Harper to speak first on the policy dimensions of the report and I'll then invite Mr O'Brien to speak to the legal dimensions. Each will speak for 20 minutes and we will have time for questions at the end of the presentations. So Professor Harper, I'll ask you to address us first. Great. Thank you. Well, thank you very much, Anne, for those warm words of introduction and good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for turning out in such large numbers and opting to spend your lunchtime hearing about competition policy and competition law. As they say, we know you had a choice. Uh, thank you for choosing us. Since it's a legal audience, let me begin with a disclaimer. I'm not a lawyer. I'm an economist by training. And so I'm going to speak about the economic aspects of this review. And I'm going to leave the legal aspects to my lawyer whom I brought with me to do exactly that. So you're going to have to bear with me. I'm the warm-up act, uh, but you will get 
to hear from Michael. And uh, I, having seen his slides, he will take you through all the legal detail you are hungering to know, right? And for me, more de legal detail than I ever wanted to know, but it's all there. It's been a great privilege, if I may say so, in uh, Michael's presence, and I believe his brother Norman's also here, uh, to be able to say how much I've learned from Michael during this whole exercise. There were two lawyers on the panel. Uh, Peter Anderson's also a, a lawyer and a former solicitor. Uh, and Sue and I were economists. So a couple of economists and a couple of lawyers. We had lots of fun. Uh, learned a lot from uh, Michael and from Peter about uh, the law. And so uh, I feel, in fact, the other day someone wrote me an email and said that I was beginning to sound like a lawyer. I don't know whether that's a good thing or a bad thing, but in this audience, perhaps we should opt for the former. Well, ladies and gentlemen, uh, my task in the next few minutes is to give you an overview of the report. Uh, you would be aware that the panel has now been formally disbanded. Uh, so I am the former chair of the Competition Policy Review. Uh, the report has been handed to the government on time and on budget, and now it is a matter for the government. So of course, at question time, you're welcome to ask us whatever you would like, uh, but I preface my remarks now and our question time by pointing out to you that these matters are still sub judice, if that's the right expression. Uh, the government has taken our recommendations, is consulting uh, on our recommendations for the next, or well, to the end of May, uh, and then has indicated through the minister that there will be a response from the government to the report. I know the minister is scheduled to speak to CEDA on the 1st of July, and that is um, billed as being an opportunity for the government to respond. Uh, I'm not sure, obviously, in what detail the government would respond at that time, but at the very least, the process is moving along. Perhaps some of you are here because your clients have uh, enlisted you to assist in giving submissions to the government in response to the report. Uh, that's fine too. Maybe there are some things that we say today that will help you in your task, if that's what you've been asked to do. Well, it's a four-person panel, as you can see, myself as Chair Peter and Michael, obviously, and Sue McCluskey, who is the Chief Executive of the Regional Australia Institute and a former member of the Productivity Commission. And she also set up the Office for Breast Practice Regulation. So Sue is a regulation economist. Uh, and then, um, for my sins, I was asked to chair this particular exercise. We were given a 12-month time frame with very broad terms of reference. People told us that these terms of reference were so broad at the outset, they wondered whether we'd make any progress at all. Uh, well, in fact, of course, what we managed to do was to produce a 550-page report. Uh, and in our view, that report <coughs> covers all of the terms of reference. Uh, and no one has suggested otherwise at this point. I'm very much committed to consultation in public policy exercises. Uh, as an economist, my view, and I'm not alone in this, Gary Banks is somebody whose example I follow very closely in these matters, is that if you want policy proposals to stick, if you actually want to make some progress in changing economic policy, then it's very helpful to speak to people often on the way through. So that at the end of the day, people might not agree with you, and I know in this instance many people disagree with different aspects of what we've recommended to the government, but at least no one can say they weren't asked. No one can say they had no opportunity to speak to these people. We have no idea how they reached these conclusions. They certainly didn't ever talk to us. Well, if that accusation were made with some basis, I would consider that I had failed in my task. So um, at the risk of, of overdoing it, I'll be doing the welcome with my colleagues, possibly especially with Michael, who had a busy legal practice to, uh, to manage during this entire process. Uh, I insisted that we have as many meetings as we possibly could. Uh, and there's 150 stakeholder meetings. That's really just the tip of the iceberg. We sought public submissions, not once but twice. And we have received nearly 1,000 submissions. All of those submissions are publicly available, except the ones that people insisted be confidential, and there's only a handful of those. Uh, I insisted in turn that if uh, people wanted their submissions to be confidential, which of course they had every right to do, I wanted to hear what they had to say. And nevertheless, if they made it confidential, we couldn't quote them. And I wanted the opportunity to be able to do that. And you can find all that on the website. No doubt you've already taken a look at that. Well, here's the big picture, if you like, uh, why we fight. Why are we even bothering to do this? 
It won't have escaped your attention that the main driver of Australia's living standards over the last dec decade or so has been the massive mining investment boom that's followed the terms of trade surge, which in turn is derived from the growth of China. Now, all of that is beginning to wane. Not so much the growth of China, although the rates are coming down as, of course, that economy gets bigger and bigger. It naturally grows more slowly. But in particular, the mining investment boom, which is the largest investment boom we've experienced uh, in our history. We've had other mining booms before. But a mining investment boom of this scale is unprecedented. But as that comes off, and it comes off extremely quickly, terms of trade come down, down comes the mining investment boom, uh, then what that does is to produce a big downdraft on Australia's living standards. That will eventually slow, and we'll return to more normal rates of growth. But for the time being, we are, as they say, uh, fighting headwinds, if you want to use a different analogy. So it's important to seek alternative sources of growth in Australia's living standards that go beyond just the drive in mining investment. We don't expect that to be repeated any time soon. In the end, you drive living standards by improving labour productivity. Output per hour worked is the ultimate source of growth in income per hour worked. That is to say, living standards. These are two sides of the same coin. Uh, how do you improve output per hour work? That is to say, productivity. There are various levers which economists point to, uh, but one of the most effective levers in driving productivity growth is competition. Why? Because competition stimulates innovation, and innovation in turn improves output per head. Uh, that has been true certainly since the Industrial Revolution, and uh, even before that, if you go back into the Middle Ages, you can find evidence to sustain precisely that relationship. So this is nothing new. Competition policy, both here in Australia, uh, which we've clearly had uh, in profusion for the last 20 years or more. Uh, even before that, there were, of course, traces of competition policy and competition law in existence, but really got going uh, with the Hawke-Keating governments and the uh, changes that were made during that time. That strength of comp competition and competitive reform has driven Australian living standards, and that's a matter of record. So there's a productivity agenda that underlies this. There's also simply an agenda of change. Competition policy and competition law, as I've just said, is nothing new. Uh, one of the nice things about this particular review is that we were able to go to people and simply say, well, of course, you understand what aspects of this look like. Uh, we have lived through the deregulation of electricity at retail levels, retail supply of electricity, for example. Various states of the Commonwealth have already deregulated their retail trading hours. All of this goes back to the Hilmer Review of the early 1990s. And while different states of the Commonwealth have progressed this agenda at different rates, basically around the country you can find examples of these policies in action. They have been lived. People understand what they are. So one particular jibe, which I have to say I repudiate, is the notion that somehow this report is full of quote unquote academic, theoretical and untested ideas. That is simply false. And it is demonstrably false. Many of the ideas, particularly those that have attracted the attention of the Herald Sun and elsewhere, retail trading restrictions, pharmacy location and ownership rules, things like this, they were on the Hilmer Review 20 years ago. And a number of these things have been introduced. While it's still true that retail trading hours are heavily regulated in Western Australia and South Australia, that's not true here in Victoria. It hasn't been true in Tasmania or even New South Wales. So you don't have to sort of think that this is academic stuff and nonsense. Go and ask. Go and look. Find out what life is like. See if it's true that if you deregulate trading hours, suddenly all the small businesses die and all you have is large supermarkets. I mean, you don't take my word for it. Go and visit any large shopping centre in Melbourne and see for yourself. So these ideas are not new, but they did need to be reinvigorated. Why? Because circumstances have changed in the last 20 years. Hardly news to a young audience like this. The forces of globalization, the rapid onset of population aging. These ideas were there in the early 1990s as well. But the impact of that had nowhere near gathered the strength that it now has. And of course, the digital revolution well, the World Wide Web, by some measures, was only switched on in 1996, and Hilmer reported in 1993. 
So there's nothing in Hilma about the digital world at all. And yet that's totally revolutionized and is revolutionizing and disrupting the way various parts of our world now operate. Here's a concrete example. In the Hilma report, alongside a lot of discussion about location rules for pharmacy, was an equally vigorous discussion about location rules for news agents. The word news agent doesn't even appear in our report, let alone location rules for news agents. Why not? Because technology just vaporized it. And technology is in the process of vaporizing other rules. Some of them need a bit of a helping hand. Others need at least to be pointed out to people. Many people have been, been quite surprised about the existence of location and ownership rules for pharmacy, which strike people as Byzantine. Really? Are you serious? <laughs> well, that was all in Hilma. We were asked to do a root and branch review. And that, I believe, we've done. And what a root and branch review does is to get the torch out and to shine into every dusty corner. And in those dusty corners, we found things like pharmacy location and ownership rules, and some restrictions on growing and selling potatoes. The less of that, the better. So it's a reinvigorated agenda for microeconomic reform, which is designed to do two things. Firstly, to play its part in undergirding the growth of Australian living standards. This is about people's lives. And the second thing that it's about is updating our policies, laws, and institutions for a changed world, for a world in which the forces of globalization, aging, and especially digital revolution are shaping and testing the way the Australian economy operates. Professor Hilmer and his colleagues took competition in the, the non-tradable parts of the Australian economy, like electricity, roads, and so forth, ports. We've gone beyond that now into all of those areas in which the government operates that are potentially contestable, most especially human services, health, education, and welfare, the largest, fastest growing parts of the Australian economy, and certainly the fastest growing parts of public outlays in our country. We've sought to move disciplines of competition where they are appropriate. Choice, contestability, diversity, flexibility into those parts of the economy which have traditionally operated on the principle of you can have any colour you like so long as it's black. Well, my generation might have put up with that. My parents' generation certainly did. But I imagine there are a lot of young people sitting right in front of me now who would be shocked. Shocked at the idea that you could just have no choice at all. You just simply take what the state hands out and be grateful for it. That's not the world you're going into. That's not the world. We want our institutions and laws and policies to help to facilitate. That's what this report is about. Lifting the veil on that future. We're to drive competition across the economy. There's a national challenge, therefore, for all levels of government and there are benefits, we argue, for all jurisdictions. I mentioned these three forces for change. You'll find these throughout the report, informing the way that we have sought to analyze each of these issues. The logical structure of the report, we think, is quite clear. Uh, in the end, we're asking questions about our existing competition laws, policies, and institutions about how fit for purpose they are for the future. How fit for purpose are they for the productivity challenge we have? How fit for purpose are they for the future that we believe is unfolding. That renders down into six questions which focus on whether these institutions, policies and laws work in the long-term interests of consumers, whether they promote diversity, choice and responsiveness, whether they stimulate innovation, entrepreneurship and so on, you can see there. Through that filter of those six questions, we then passed the existing policies, laws and institutions. We prepared a draft report and published that in September, you will recall. Uh, this is another, well, we were asked to do that by the government anyway, but it's another important part of process, in my view. You don't publish a draft report in which you just raise a whole bunch of questions. No, no, no. This is a draft report, right? This is what we will say, unless you give us good reason to change our minds. Uh, and like J.M. Keynes, if we find that the facts have changed, we'll change our minds. No problem with that, but up, that's what a draft is. Give us the feedback. Of course, there were some areas in which we sought more guidance because we'd not heard enough. And so there, we did pose questions, or at least alternatives. 
and Michael will speak to that in regard to Section 46, no doubt, in a moment. The three areas in which the report has been chunked, competition policy, laws and institutions, are the three dimensions of Australia's competition framework that we were asked to look into. There were 53 recommendations in the draft report and 56 in the final report, and you can see there on that chart some changes, not a large number, but a number of changes from the final to the, dra or the draft of the final, I should say. Uh, two new policy recommendations, one to do with competition and government procurement, another to do with informed choice. Uh, we called, of course, Section 46, some recommendations to do with exclusive dealing and industrial agreements that Michael will cover, and then we called uh, our recommendation in regards to governance of the ACCC. The rest was pretty much the same. If you look broadly then at the policy reforms, I mentioned moving competition, the disciplines of choice and contestability, diversity, through into human services separating policy regulation and service provision. A greater emphasis on competition in government procurement and privatisation. Some comments about intellectual property, reforming transport systems, recommendations to remove cabotage and sea and air, cost-effective road pricing, competition to be part of our planning and zoning rules at local government level, and finishing the work that Hilma started 20 years ago in reforming electricity, gas and water. I've skipped over the law for obvious reasons you'll hear from Michael in a minute. Thinking briefly then about the competition institutions, indeed, we recommended that two new regulators be created, but that they be built on existing regulators. So the Australian Council for Competition Policy is a coordinating body, just like the National Competition Council was for Hilma. The National Competition Council uh, will be retired if these recommendations to be accepted and replaced by this body. It is a body designed to drive the agenda, but most importantly, it's not a Commonwealth body. It is a national body. That is to say, it's responsible or accountable to all of the jurisdictions, not just the Commonwealth, which changes the dynamic. In the early years of the Keating government, it was much easier to have a dynamic driven by the Commonwealth. Uh, times have changed. Now the states and territories have to be bought in, and this is our proposal to do just that. The access and pricing regulator is carved Adam's rib-like out of the ACC, ACCC I should say, uh, by taking the energy regulator out and building a more general access and pricing regulator around it. Another aspect of the digital world is that networks will become much more pervasive and important. The world of network economics. Well, you need a regulator which is expert in dealing with the thorny questions of access and pricing which arise when networks drive economic activity. That's our vision for the access and pricing regulator. And finally, some recommendations about governance of the ACCC, which in our view uh, has suffered from a very weak separation between its governance and its day-to-day -day executive management. All of the commissioners are full-time and they're all effectively working as senior managers. Uh, we don't believe that is a good model for governance and therefore we've recommended that it be changed. Finally, some comments about implementation. I've mentioned to you the stage at which the process now finds itself with the government seeking responses from the public to what we've had to say uh, before it makes up its mind. Let me just point out that in this final report, unlike the draft report, there's an entire chapter which deals with implementation. Again, we're very keen to make it absolutely clear. This is not theoretical academic stuff and nonsense. There are steps planned out here. There is a plan. And the plan indicates what you should do first, which levels of government are responsible, and roughly how much time it would take. There's plenty of room for cooperation and collaboration in all of this, and in many cases the reforms are building on momentum which already exists. And finally, of course, there is a roadmap. I mentioned the prioritisation and timelines, uh, but with the assistance uh, of Chris Jose, who's sitting right in front of us here. Thank you, Chris. Uh, we were able, with Michael, of course, and others, to actually prepare some model legislative provisions, which you'll find as part of the report. So again, this isn't airy-fairy stuff. What would this look like? If it were on the statute books, there it is, in black and white. That's what it looks like. Is that what the draftsman would come up with if the government, this parliament decides to affirm the law? Well, that's a, di a different matter. But at least it gives, particularly, I suspect, people in this audience, an ability to grasp what this would look like if it were actually written down in black and white on the pages of a statute. We're very proud of this work. 
we commend all the recommendations to the government. Uh, people ask about what success we think we might have, that is to say, in seeing all of this come to fruition. Let me just conclude on with two brief remarks. Uh, the first, of course, is that many parts of this report can only be implemented by the states and territories and not the Commonwealth. Other parts, like the CCA, can only be changed by the Commonwealth and not the states and territories. And they get other parts where all levels of government would cooperate. So even if it were true, I'm not prejudging this for a second, but even if it were true that the Commonwealth government can't act on this for political reasons, there's nothing to stop the states and territories from getting on with different parts of it, and a number of them already have. The Northern Territory and the ACT have already announced inquiries into, into their taxi regulation uh, with a view to opening up those regulations to deal with ride sharing. The New South Wales government has already made a start on moving contestability into human services health in particular. This is already starting. And furthermore, uh, at the federal level even, the opposition, the Australian Labor Party, through the spokesperson Mr Bowen, the shadow treasurer, has already indicated that the Labor Party supports many of the recommendations in this report. Uh, they have a number of reservations which they can speak to themselves, but they support the bulk of this because much of this, of course, emerged from Labor Party policy over a lengthy period of time. So the dynamic, as this is argued out in the federal parliament, this is just a conjecture on my part, may be very different. It may be that the Labor Party, the opposition, actually spurs the government and says, well, Minister, where are the bills? We're ready to vote. You don't need to deal with the minor parties in the Senate. You don't need to deal with other particular voices. Uh, we're on side with much of this, and we're waiting for the bills. All of that will be revealed as the year unfolds, but I suggest to you that the political dynamic which surrounds this work uh, may be very different from that which has surrounded previous attempts to make major change at the policy level in our country. Thank you, Anne. Thank you for a most uh, stimulating presentation of what is the most complex report.